this video is really about criticism and it's probably for both the viewer and I think the, uh, the artist an important ability to try to acquire. Uh, criticism allows us to, for example, uh, uh, gets us thinking about, let's say, about buying a home. Why is one piece of architecture better than another? Why is it best for me? How does it function well? These are all parts of things that we need to understand and learn to make good decisions about a lot of things. Um, the difficulty with criticism is that it is uh, a process that can be both subjective and objective and it's you know just because you don't like fish for example doesn't mean that all fish recipes are wrong nobody should be eating the damn things and, and uh, acquiring that kind of taste but there are people that like fish a lot of people like fish dishes It's easy to be subjective. It's easy to say, uh, I like this, uh, but I don't like that. And that makes that thing that you're liking or not liking uh, good or bad, just on a personal judgment on your part, not objectively. And of course, everybody has a right to, uh, uh, when they go to a museum, because that's what we're talking about here is art, to uh, like certain things above other things. But when you have to tackle things objectively, as I did, both as a teacher and an artist, uh, it was a difficult kind of proposition for me to have to learn, but a necessary one. And I think it's a necessary one as a viewer, too, because you can begin to acquire in doing this sort of thing a greater ability to learn how to actually see, to look at things in a real kind of way. Uh, and as I said, when, when I was teaching, I really had to, to uh, rise above this. I mean, I had a class of, let's say, 20, 20 students who were a more advanced class who were, who were painting and uh, who I pushed towards being able to do whatever they wanted to do. And some of those things that they wanted to do, I liked. Some of them I just plain didn't like. But did I have the right then to starve their creativity because of my likes and dislikes? Uh, the obvious conclusion for me was that no, uh, that they had a right to do what they were doing and my job there. Uh, and also my job as a painter was to uh, help uh, find a way to uh, get to the goal that they were after. And whatever criticism I offered, uh, to try to offer that criticism in terms of, uh, in terms of that goal. But it's, uh, as I said, it's difficult to be objective. It's, you, 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 tend to want to look at things not as I want it to be. You want to, what I was trying to do was to look at things not as I wanted it to, to be, but what, what it is. And that's really true in terms of uh, looking at art uh, in general. And as I said, you can really improve your ability to view and see things if you can begin to objectively start to move outside of that zone of subjectivity that we all find ourselves in. Uh, so what do I mean about that? Uh, about being objective? Well, it's hard. It means looking at the story uh, that the artist is trying to tell or the idea that they're trying to get across. Then the question becomes, was it successful? And then the other question becomes, why was it success successful? What were the things that uh, were manipulated by the person who was making this work of art 
that uh, made it come across with a, with the kind of with with a truthfulness, with an honesty, with a delivery that made the experience. And I like to talk about art as, as really as experience, not in terms of information. Uh, what's making that experience real uh, to you or to me uh, as a viewer? And then once that determination is made, what is it uh, that they did that allowed that to take place, that made that happen? What were the conclusions they came up with that would somehow, um, uh, that somehow made that, uh, that feeling or that experience visible to me in, in, a, in a real kind of way? Now, uh, So, once you can begin to as, uh, kind of establish that sense of is the goal of the artist meeting the artist's expert expectations or is the, the goal of what you're looking at meeting its expectations or is it not uh, or is it not reaching a conclusion in, I don't want to say it, a perfect kind of way that gets everything across. And there are people uh, that uh, are capable of somehow uh, making, getting to that, that point of uh, perfection, a point where in a work of art, uh, there's no room to find another way of doing it. And the only room there is, is to find an alternative way of accomplishing it, not changing it. So, um, what I want to get into here is to do a little bit of, kind of a little bit of teaching. Uh, a little bit of teaching how to essentially, um, how to see. Painted by uh, by Renoir, and it uh, Renoir was an interesting character in terms of an artist. He could be up and do some fantastic, fantastic things, and he could be just, as far as I'm concerned, uh, somebody who would turn out uh, pretty mediocre paintings and uh, things that were just plain, uh, eh, really not very good. And this happens to be one of them. And it's what I'm going to start off with, and I'm going to criticize this painting and talk to you about what kinds of things uh, to look for in, in terms of what weaknesses are in something and why it doesn't reach a conclusion that is optimal. If we started, the first thing I want you to notice is the background down here. You feel like these two figures are virtually sitting on a stage set and that that area behind the figure with the, the brunette uh, behind her is kind of not real. It is just uh, something behind there that uh, doesn't really surround the figure in any way or put make us feel that the figure are within some kind of uh, three-dimensional context. Why does that happen? Well, for starters, he doesn't marry that foreground with the background. If you begin to look at that, uh, the foreground, you see areas in there that uh, have a little brighter colors, a little, little more intensity, uh, a little bit more detail. Now, none of those things are reintroduced into the background. Consequently, it separates out and it gives a uh, kind of a, a, a falsity to what we're seeing and takes it away from having a reality to it. The other thing, if I just look at the painting in general, the color is boring. I mean extremely boring. It, there is just a kind of monotonous monotone to the way that he has delivered the color in this painting, and there is very little, uh, if any, anything, to enjoy about the color or using color in a way to enhance the idea of these two figures in there and how they're engaged with one another and talking about uh, 
and, and she's playing the piano and, and having that whole thing um, feel experientially interesting. So there is a dullness that takes place here. What else can I say about it? Well, if I just look at, at the drawing in, in certain cases itself, there are problems. Let's take a look at the, the uh, brunette's arm to the left and look at that wrist. I mean, he's a good draftsman. He can be a, a terrific draftsman normally. Why? It, it always amazes me. Why does he make that kind of mistake in the drawing and not treat it in a professional kind of manner? It's poor draftsmanship there, and it's an awkward moment in that painting. Um, trying to think of anything else. It, uh, uh, let's leave it here for now, and then we're going to move on to something that I think works extremely well and creates a, uh, an interest and uh, an involvement for us in a story that uh, is great to look at. This painting is, uh, is a painting by Mary Cassant, and it, she's a, a painter that, uh, extremely good painter, and uh, usually, unlike uh, Renoir, makes very few mistakes, and most of her things work exceedingly well. And uh, if, let's talk about those things that make it work exceedingly well. And, but for starters, I just want to say this is a touchy subject to deal with. This kind of subject matter could look so trite. And so, um, well, I'm trying to think of the word to say, just, just overly precious, let's put it that way. But how does she get, get away with this? How does she create an image that uh, could be this way and make it so compelling and intriguing? Well, for starters, uh, Mary Cassatt, like many of the painters at this, during this time, were aware of the photograph and looking through that photographic uh, viewfinder. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is the way that when you look through a viewfinder on a camera, we crop things off. And she has done that extremely effectively here by cropping off that bottom of the picture in front of us, by doing it to the dress on the side and the dress to the left of the, the mother, it gives a sense of reality and we see it as we're looking through a window in a very voyeuristic way. We're looking at an ongoing, um, ongoing process that's going on here between the mother and the child and her bathing that child. What are the things in here that I said that make this kind of background painting work when it didn't work in the Renoir? Well, let's take a look at just what she's done, for example, with that intense pink that is on the dresser drawer above the child. You see those little sort of dots of, of floral dots of pink. Um, that gets repeated in the picture itself and in the figures. And in addition to that, the theme of that flower is repeated in the uh, oriental carpet just below, almost in the crack center of that uh, of, of, of that painting on the bottom below the, uh, the bowl that she's cleaning the child's feet in. What else is done in here is also interesting. How do you create a sense of belonging, a sense of intimacy, a sense of relationship between the child and the mother? And how do you do it with the visual things that you have to work with. Well, let's go up to the heads up there, the both, both of the figures, the child and the mother. Let's look at that black on the right-hand side of the mother's head, and then look at the intense black that's created at the same point on the child's head. What does this do? This loses an edge. It creates a marriage between one thing and the next, and gives that kind of intimacy and that kind of organic uh, involvement between those two figures in a very beautiful kind of uh, kind of way. What else is going on in here that I can call as a repeat that holds everything together? Well, if I look at the woman's dress, for example, and I look at that kind of those kind of mauves that go through the stripes, which incidentally are beautiful in themselves to look at, 
and is one of the hallmarks of this painting that I enjoy so much, and that is Mary Cassatt's ability to work with pattern, to make pattern a beautiful incident in a painting in itself, aside from what the story is about with the mother and child. But I was talking about the stripes, and I wanted to say, look at that mauve in that one stripe there, and how that mauve is picked up in the, uh, in the background back there. Unlike unlike what was going on in that Renoir, you feel that these figures are in a three-dimensional context. It gives things a sense of reality. What else goes on here? Something that I feel is really quite beautiful. In the Renoir, for example, what Renoir did is he spent all his time looking at the heads on the figures and right in that section by creating detail in there and not very many other places. In, in the Cassatt, look at how she moves that detail around from point to point. She gets us to investigate that, that whole image that we're looking at. It is an explorative event for us to view. It also gives a sense of moment and time. It moves us back and forth, back and forth in that painting, and gives a degree of drama to what we're seeing. This, uh, quite frankly, is a... Um, it's just a beautiful painting to look at and to enjoy from so many aspects in here. So we'll leave it at that, and uh, now we're going to, going to, to uh, I guess I'm going to conclude at this point, and to um, say my name is William Nichols. I plan on making more of these videos. I, I hope they offer some kind of informational quality to both the artist and to people who are viewing paintings. Um, to begin to understand, as I talked about earlier, how to begin to see and explore things in a way that allows you to define what's good and what's bad in something, what makes something a stronger image and what makes something a weaker image. Those are things that I think are interesting to, uh, to observe and to learn and allows us to take that into to other things in our life. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. I plan on introducing a new topic every two weeks if you care to subscribe. Thanks again.